Just a little bit of housekeeping before we actually get into week three here, and that is the week two set between the Alaskan Absols and the um, Flatland Flat Sands. Played shortly after I finished making the week two video. In fact, I don't remember whether I had finished uploading yet when they played it, but nonetheless, it missed my cutoff, and so we'll cover it here. Um, okay, so the Flat Sands have brought the Whimsicott and Hisuian Typhlosion mode that we know is making a lot of noise in VGC these days, so might as well, might, might be solved in draft two. I see Mudsdale and Lucario here. I So Whimsicott could, you have a, could have beat up setup available for either one of those. We saw the beat up Lucario, the beat up into Justified Lucario in week one. They also could use it to set up Stamina on Mudsdale. Um, Clefable is a very versatile Pokemon, but it's probably running some kind of solid support tech with Unaware, and I don't know what the Scraggy is doing, but we'll see if they bring it to a game. On the Absol's side, we have a strong mix of Pokemon, but I don't necessarily know what the game plan here is. Uh, Pre-Marina is strong into Typhlosion and Mudsdale, um, so it certainly could be helping to cover for those. Incineroar... Maybe with the right Terra type can help deal with Lucario, at least slow it down. Um, Sarina with Queenly Majesty can cover for um, priority disruption from the Whimsicott, things like Fake Tears, Cotton Spore, Encore. And then the Hisui and Gudra can try to set up, but into these particular offensive threats, I think that might be a tall order for it. But let's just get into the game one and see what happens. Uh, so we see Girafferig and Incineroar lead against Whimsicott and Typhlosion. Flat Sands just going right for it um, with those two Pokemon. And Absol's maybe trying to set up Trick Room with Girafferig. I don't really know what else you do with Girafferig. Um, I don't think it even gets Armor Tail. It's Weakness Policy Incineroar. I have no idea what they're going for with that. But that changes a lot of things here. As the Eruption takes out Girafferig and does a ton of damage to Incineroar. Darkest Lariat with Typhlosion having uh, turned off its Dark Weakness doesn't quite KO, and the Typhlosion seems to just be in the driver's seat, even against this Pre-Marina. I mean, I think, depending on what you have in the back, you could still just do a ton of damage, finish off the Incineroar, but um, probably smarter to pivot around. Mudsdale seems like an odd choice to bring in here, but maybe they just don't think they need it in this game uh, from this point as Incineroar will knock out the Whimsicott. I think the offensive Incineroar is actually pretty interesting in this game. Uh, it put in a decent amount of work. It just took so much damage from the Typhlosion before it did. Single target Hyper Voice, but it's in Sun. Mudsdale doesn't take that much. And the Typhlosion gets back in now with Tailwind up. We see the Sarina within the Salt Vest, Terra Fire. But the Typhlosion instead of Eruption goes for Solar Beam and maybe the Typhlosion is choice and it needed to switch out to change moves. That might be what happened there. Uh, but in any case, the Pre-Marina is just obliterated by the Solar Beam, and I don't think Sarina is winning this one on its own. The Terra Fire Sarina is a nice tech here, but... Um, yeah, Trop Kick doesn't KO the Mudsdale. Sarina can take another Body Press here, or a High Horsepower, now that it's turned into a Fire-type. And uh, the Flat Sand's kind of just swept there. I do think the Offensive Incineroar is a really interesting tech that... We actually saw put in a decent amount of work in game one, but the Flat Sands just have so much offensive power. Uh, I should say offensive fire power because much of it's coming from that Typhlosion. I don't know how the Absols are going to adjust to deal with that. Maybe the Umbreon can do something. Umbreon is especially bulky. It's a dark type. Um, it may be that they've engineered it to deal with the Typhlosion somehow, although they didn't bring it in game one when the Typhlosion was an obvious threat, so... If the Incineroar is the best they've got, I think they might just get swept by Typhlosion again, but let's see. The adjustment in Game 2 is it's Pre-Marina and Umbreon leading against Mudsdale and Scraggy. Scraggy does come out. It shows um, Intimidate, which is not surprising. Not really doing anything in this lead position. And I guess we'll see what the Umbreon has uh, cooked up for the Typhlosion, but Flat Sands in the driver's seat here after winning Game 1, able to adjust and probably keep Typhlosion in the back um, as they see what the Absols have to counter it. We have Fake Out from the Scraggy, and it's Calm Mind Umbreon. That might actually be pretty smart here, but it has to deal with this Mudsdale. Uh, the Pre-Marina took so much damage there from the Fake Out and the High Horsepower. I feel like 
in this position, you're probably hoping that Primarina can take out the Mudsdale, and then Umbreon doesn't have to worry about body press while it sets up, and it can deal with Typhlosion in the back. I think I see the vision there, but the fake out high horsepower did so much damage to Primarina. Honestly, maybe you keep Primarina in and go for an attack anyway and try to chip the Mudsdale at the very least. I mean, it could do a lot with a Hyper Voice, right? And Primarina is probably faster than Mudsdale. Most likely. I think maybe you have to keep Primarina in there and just attack. It's a bad position, but it's a bad position no matter what. And depending on Umbreon's Terra type, it might be able to play around the body press anyway and set up enough that it doesn't need its dark typing against Typhlosion. But Primarina switches out for Giraffe Rig, so no damage into the Mudsdale, which goes Terra Steel in any case. And Umbreon Baton passes to Primarina. I think this... I think there's a way this could have been a good tech, but... Again, they've let the Primarina take so much damage, it's not going to one-shot the Mudsdale after Mudsdale terastalized. I don't know what the Giraffe Rig is here for. Trick Room is in this position only beneficial to the Flat Sands. It might be a different story if they have Typhlosion in the back, but you're still dealing with the Mudsdale right now. I think the Primarina has just taken too much damage to get through this. I think it might have been interesting to play toward an Umbreon endgame if Umbreon is built to set up an attack itself, and if it has a Terra type that can work in this situation, but that's a lot of assumptions about the Umbreon set. It may be that it, that it's, that it can't do that. The Scraggy shows coaching, and Mudsdale might just run away with this game. They're a fairy on the Giraffe Rig, so any thought of terrestrializing Primarina or Umbreon is out now. The Giraffe Rig really wants to do something, but it's lucky that it wasn't targeted by that Heavy Slam. It gets the Trick Room up, but it's Mudsdale... I mean, look, maybe if you're running mid-speed Primarina, you know what? The mud I mean, Flat Sands didn't bring Trick Room of their own, so they might be they might actually have speed on Mudsdale. Primarina might be mid-speed. Maybe Primarina's slower here. Have I seen anything to indicate either way? Oh, turn one, right? The Primarina flinched before the Mudsdale moved, so no, Trick Room I think only hurts you in this position. I don't know why they've invested so much into setting it up. But yeah, Primarina just drops to a heavy slam. They've given the Mudsdale the first move there. The Reflect comes in too late, and Incineroar is not going to win this game by itself. Uh, I think... I I think... Yeah, I don't know why they set up Trick Room there. They, they invested a lot of their resources into something that really only hurt them. And depending on the Umbreon set, I actually think maybe here you try to win the game with Umbreon, but maybe it just wasn't engineered for that. The weakness policy Incineroar actually taking out the Mudsdale is pretty pretty funny there. I really like what they did with the Incineroar this week. I think they just didn't have the right game plan for it. Um, and Umbreon is going to try to set up with Calm Mind, but against this Lucario, as they show, they, by the way, they had Clefable and Lucario in the back. They left the Typhlosion on the bench in game two. Lucario just runs through. We never find out Umbreon's Terra type because they use their Terra on Giraffe Rig in, I think, a really dubious position for it. Um, the Flat Sands played that really well. Uh, Typhlosion and Whimsicott just running wild in game one, and their opponent not really having the kind of power that they needed to keep up. And then mixing it up and keeping Typhlosion uh, out of game two, forcing the adjustment to it from the game one game plan, but then running something entirely different that could counter the adjustment. Lucario and Typhlosion actually have an interesting synergy there because opponents, some teams in this league have a lot of dark types, and if they spam their dark types against the Typhlosion, then they have trouble dealing with Lucario. They also have trouble dealing with Clefable and Mudsdale. So I think the vision behind the construction of this Typhlosion team for the Flat Sands is becoming pretty, becoming a good bit clearer here. Um, and they actually have a, a, a ton of really cool synergies in their draft that I think could take them a long way. On the Umbreon side... I feel like there's just not enough power, at least in the Pokemon that they brought to this game. They had some interesting techs that I think were pretty cool. I think there's a version of Calm Mind Umbreon that could have been hard for the Flat Sands to deal with, although the Lucario really messes that up in the end. Um, there's not really a Terra type on Umbreon that covers for everything that it can have to deal with here. So maybe I excited myself too much about the Umbreon, but I feel like there's a world where it could have put in work if they got the role and the game plan right. The weakness policy in Cineroar was pretty cool. 
Um, I still think Pre-Marina is a very good Pokemon in this format, but these Pokemon are just taking too much damage before they're able to get going, and they either don't have or aren't bringing the right tools to support them properly. Um, they have, uh, in between the end of the week and my recording, they have made a trade. I'm not sure whether I'll be reporting it in the week three or week four video. So it may be that they're trying to find the right adjustments now to get their team to where it needs to be. But the Flat Sands draft is looking very strong, and the Absols one, I think, I think it has potential, but it still has some things to figure out. In any case, uh, that's it for week two, finally, once and for all. And we're just going to go ahead and cut to week three now. Now we actually get started on week three. And it's been a full week of PDL action. We'll be fully caught up on the schedule when we get through this week. Starting with the standings, of course, and already going into week three, there are just three teams still undefeated. The Dallas Dragapults, Flatland Flat Sands, and Big Time Sand Rush. Everyone else has lost at least once. And look at this clump of teams in the middle. Six teams out of 16 with a perfectly even record so far. So, of course, we'll see some separation over the next few weeks, but right now, as I keep saying, it is still very much anyone's season to win. Three trades to cover this week. And it starts with the Arctic Articunos dropping Haxorus and picking up Gudra. Uh, remember, Arctic Articunos um, will cover their are covering their own season on the, their coach's channel, Reckless Trico. Again, that's Reckless Trico. But Trico did mention uh, in the Discord that they picked up Gudra because they wanted some more special bulk on their team, and that does make sense to me. I think you have a lot of physical bulk already with Chestnut, Skarmory. Blaze Breed Tauros with Intimidate, but other than Blastoise being kind of a bulky Pokemon on both sides, there's not that much on the special side. And it, Gudra might be a drop in offensive power from Haxorus, at least I think it probably is, but it can still hit pretty hard. Uh, you can still, there are ways to set it up, and it's just a powerful Pokemon all around, so this trade makes a lot of sense to me. Um, up next we have the Miami Palafins dropping Conkeldur and picking up Hisuian Lilligant. This looks to me like a a, a change in direction for this team. I don't know. I didn't look very closely at it before I set up the slide, but um, they had the Orin Guru to set Trick Room, and then Conkeldur is kind of their obvious Trick Room attacker. I guess they do have other Pokemon that can do damage under Trick Room, but Conkeldur. I mean, you can pair Orin Guru with our Chalodon still. That could still be pretty strong. But they do lose some power under Trick Room without Conkeldur. Um, and I'm not sure what kind of new direction the Hisui and Lilligant brings here. I'm not sure whether Klefki gets Sunny Day as well as Rain Dance. Even if it doesn't, Hisui and Lilligant could be a countermeasure to an opponent's sun, but it's also just a fast fighting type that can hit hard without relying on Trick Room, and this isn't a hard Trick Room team, so I don't know exactly what the plan is, but I, I, I can kind of see how Hisui and Lilligant can fit together, complement our child on, and um, the other key pieces on this team, but we'll have to see how they use it. Finally, the Alaskan Absols have dropped Hisuian Gudra and picked up Dusclops. So just as uh, one Gudra entered the league this season, the other Gudra is, at least for now, out. Uh, this week, I mean. This is a trade where I'm not really sure that I see the vision. Dusclops is mostly known as a good trick room setter, and I think that might be what the Absols want because Giraffarig has really not been delivering in that role. But once you get the Trick Room up, I don't know necessarily what Pokemon on this team are doing damage. Um, I feel like the <clears throat> I feel like if this team was going to make a trade, the best thing to go for was more power. Instead, they lose power with Hisui and Gudra having at least good stats and some ability to set up and Dusclops, you know, being good in some ways, but not those. I feel like this team is going to be very dependent on Baxcalibur and Primarina for the rest of the season, the way it's set up. But, I mean, you never know. It's not my draft. They might have something else in mind, um, and we'll just have to wait and see. Anyway, those are the three trades, so cut to the replays. As always, we'll go through them in chronological order. This week it starts with the Sandit Sandshrews versus Drago's Strongest Warrior. So it's a Sun versus Sand matchup. The Sandshrews bringing uh, the Torquil Venusaur combo, but also... Well, just like a well-rounded mix of Pokemon with Mail and DD, Greninja, Hitmontop, and Electivire. Uh, they have Wide Guard, they have Intimidate, they have 
fast water attacks into Tyranitar and the various ground and rock types on the other side that the other side could have brought at least. Uh, I'm not sure what the Indeedee will do, but maybe they have some Trick Room tech. Um, this isn't the best opponent to rip off an Expanding Force into, but with this team that they brought, it might work. Uh, and on the Drago Strongest Warrior side, you've got Tyranitar um, and Corviknight with the Comfey for healing, so they could run the same kind of game plans as in the first two weeks. Uh, depending on... The, yeah, the positioning could be a bit tricky for them because Tyranitar doesn't want to see Venusaur, especially in Sun. Corviknight doesn't want to see Torkoal. The Terra types might come into play there, might be helpful. I'm not sure what the Sandaconda is going to do this week. Maybe it has a defensive Terra type and Glare to make the Venusaur and Greninja um, less threatening. Although that's a lot of pressure on the one Terra slot for this team that I'm talking about terrestrializing almost everything. Uh, but I'm sure they have some more coherent plan than that. Uh, the Zipstrika is probably here for speed control, although it has to watch out for the Electivire, and then the Grookey can of course change the terrain, but we'll see as we get into the games, starting of course the game one here. Um, we have Venusaur Hitmontop lead against Corviknight and Sandaconda, so nobody just leading with their weather right off the bat. Of course Torkoal being slower than Tyranitar, the Sandshrews could have just done that if they wanted, um, but instead see what uh oh that's right the mirror armor goes off and weakens the hitmon top we'll see what the hitmon top goes for tarantar switches in to set its weather it's probably their intention all along venusaur throws off a grass knot that almost ko's tyranitar uh that did a lot of damage tarantar a very heavy pokemon i guess but now they get comfey in next to corviknight there's no torquil on the field comfey doesn't care about the mock punch from hitmon top corviknight does take a sleep powder um and that might be hard for it to deal with but again I don't think much is threatening Corviknight in this position, so if they can get the positioning right, they can, uh... Yeah, they can wake Corviknight up and set it up. It might just be slower um, than it would normally be. I'm just checking because... Well, let's get to the end of this turn. Okay, I was wondering whether the Comfey had safety goggles, uh, which it does not. We, we can see that because it took sand damage. Um, the Comfey might have to watch out for Sleep Powder in that case. It is, of course, not a Grass type, even though it looks like it could be. Um, that might be the one gap in Strongest Warrior's plan to set up the Corviknight. They also have to be alert to the Torkoal, or even the Electivire possibly switching in. As here is the Torkoal right away. The Venusaur could have Weather Ball. It's Terra Fire Comfey. Venusaur just goes for Sludge Bomb. Comfey still takes a lot of damage and gets poisoned. And of course, the Terra Fire doesn't give any Comfey any uh, cover into um, uh, Sleep Powder. It does. I'm, I'm checking its abilities now. If it's not running Triage, then it might have some cover against Sleep Powder, <clears throat> at least with Natural Cure. But I would think you probably run Triage. Comfey sets Tailwind. Corviknight wakes up nice and early and gets a bulk up. But they've now used their Terra on Comfey, so Corviknight has no way to cover for fire attacks. Um, do we know Corviknight's item? Could have an Aka Berry, but even then, that's single use. So, Corviknight could be uh, definitely under some pressure here, especially if the Venusaur does have Weather Ball. It might not, considering the moves it's shown so far. Um, they just protect Comfey. Venusaur goes for Sleep Powder into Corviknight, so probably doesn't have Weather Ball. It drops, misses the Sleep Powder and drops to a Brave Bird, but... Drago is kind of lucky to have gotten anything from that turn. And Corviknight takes a lot of damage from a Heat Wave, no Aka Berry. Of course, the Comfey can still heal it, but the Comfey is under a lot of pressure. Um, again, especially being poisoned. Corviknight's trying to set up, but I don't think it's going to work out in this position, as the Torkoal is just a giant problem. I thought the Tyranitar might come in there. Oh wait, the Tyranitar is almost... It's almost KO'd, so it can't, because Greninja will just knock it out. So they're kind of stuck relying on Sandaconda. If it has Sand Spit, it can potentially get the Sand back up for them, which is probably why the Torkoal switches up for Hitmon top there. Um, so the Sandshrews can just get their weather right back. Sandaconda goes for Minimize. And Corviknight knocks out Greninja with Brave Bird. 
If Corviknight didn't drop to that recoil, I feel like it would still have a chance to win the game, uh, taking out Hitmontop. Wait, is that right? Yeah, taking out Hitmontop, and then Tyranitar is faster than Torkoal, so it doesn't have as much to worry about, and you can just overwhelm the Torkoal. Um, instead, Corviknight trades itself for the uh, Greninja, and it's now Torkoal, Hitmontop against Tyranitar, uh, Sandaconda. Sandstream goes up, but the drought just goes up right after. Tyranitar drops to Mach Punch, and this coil minimized Sandaconda. Hold on. Yeah. This coil minimized Sandaconda is going to be have, have to be very lucky, I think, to get through this game. I mean, the Hitmontop is, you know, dropping its stats as it goes, and the Torkoal is weak to the high horsepower. I don't know that it takes that much luck. Um, Sandaconda falling asleep there is bad for it, actually. It, it did take that yawn, so... Yeah, from here, the Sandaconda just has to have dodge everything to win this game. It does dodge a close combat. It wakes up. High horsepower. Doesn't KO Torkoal. Another one would, but Torkoal lands the heat wave. And so the Sandshrews take game one. Uh, some interesting back and forth action in that one, and we'll see what adjustments they come up with in game two. It's now Venusaur hit him on top lead again against Comfe and Corviknight right out of the gate. Um, I mean, the Comfe Corviknight setup is interesting, and it would be very strong, except that Strongest Warrior doesn't seem to have any cover for the Sleep Powder. So Venusaur can just disrupt that all day. Um, or poison the Kumfei again if it's lucky. That was uh, that made a real difference last game. Torkoal comes right in to set up the sun. Kumfei protects. Venusaur can go for Sleep Powder into Corviknight, but instead it goes for Sludge Bomb into Kumfei. So Corviknight get, does get it set up this turn. Tyranitar changes the weather. And we see the Terra Dragon on Corviknight. I think that will be more valuable than the Terra on Kumfei was last game. Although that does mean it's no longer immune to Sludge Bomb and it can be poisoned. Um, but it's put to sleep for now. Heat Wave won't do very much to either of these Pokemon. Um, by committing the Terra on Torkoal and leaving it in, the Sandshrews are at least temporarily giving up weather control. They can get it back, but they do make their positioning a little bit trickier here, and so the Corviknight setup might actually work this time. Hit on top, of course, lowering its own attack every time it switches in isn't ideal, but Venusaur just deletes the Tyranitar with Grass Knot. Um, and yeah, the offensive threat that Venusaur poses to the Drago weather setters is uh, maybe something I was sleeping on a little bit there. It really does seem like it's down to the Corviknight to win this game, but we don't know what... Uh... Oh, okay, well, there's the Sandaconda. We do now know what the fourth Pokemon is. It just switches right out to Comfey. Venusaur running Grass Knot and Energy Ball. So that's its last move there. I guess the Grass Knot is specifically for Tyranitar. Um, and it's hard to argue because Venusaur has just been mowing down the other team's weather setters um, and giving Torkoal a chance to close out games. And the Comfey took a lot from that energy ball. So Comfey sitting on the field, keeping Corviknight healthy is, an, is again something that might just not be able to happen for very long in this one. But the Corviknight wakes up here, flinches from the fake out. Corviknight, of course, also takes sand damage now that it's terrestrialized. But not if Torkoal gets the sun up. And yeah, Comfey's already just protecting, trying to hold on in this game. Corviknight takes out Venusaur, that is a lot of pressure off. But. It's now Hitmontop. Takes out the Comfey this turn, but Corviknight also has Roost, so okay, Comfey can help Corviknight stay healthy, but Corviknight also being able to heal itself is another boost to its ability to potentially win this game. Um, especially with the Venusaur gone. Torkoal and him on top are not great offensive threats into it. Comfey also regaining some health with the Draining Kiss there. And Corviknight takes out Hitmontop, on top, so they are... The mode is working better this game with the Corviknight. They are wearing down the other team. It's Electivire in the back. But the Dragon Corviknight might just be able to hold on here. Comfey goes down, but I think the Dragon Corviknight... Oh. Okay, the U-turn is interesting. It gets the, rid of the Yawn, but it also turns off uh, its own boosts. Anaconda takes a lot from that Heat Wave. 
Orvanite might just be bulky enough, though, that it can... Oh, okay. Crit Fire Punch isn't great for it. Also, I don't think it's Sand Spit Sandaconda. I, that's why I was looking at its abilities a moment ago. I think it's Sand Veil Sandaconda. The idea being Tyranitar sets up the sand, and then Sandaconda with Minimize and Sand Veil can dodge all kinds of attacks and set up with Coil. It's an interesting idea, but when you're... When you're in such a tough weather battle, when your opponent has the slower weather setter and the Venusaur posing an offensive threat, I think having the other way to get sand up might be more valuable. But in any case, it really all does seem to come down to the Corviknight here. And I guess the Sandaconda dodging things. The Corviknight is being worn down. It just, uh, well, it got another bulk up, but the cost of a bunch of its HP, but then it got crit again, so... It's uh, Sandaconda versus Torkoal in the end here. Oh, the crit body press. Sandaconda barely holding on, and it's going to need probably two dodges to win this. I think we saw that its high horsepower was roughly a three hit KO into Torkoal. Oh, and it misses the first one. That's not a good sign. <laughs> and drops two Torkoal's body press. So, send it Sandshrews, take the 2-0 in a set that I think was closer than that score looks. But... And the timely crits definitely helped them out, but... Well, I don't know. The Terra Dragon Corviknight was a pretty good idea. It just... Yeah, it got worn down in the end, but I think not covering for Sleep Powder was maybe the bigger problem on <clears throat> the Drago's Strongest Warrior side. Um, it was just so easy, if Sandra's got Weather Control especially, to slow down the setup mode so that it just took too long to get going, especially with Venusaur also posing an offensive threat to the Tyranitar, which made weather control somewhat easier. Uh, but we move on now to Big Time Sand Rush versus um, Lightning Lancers. We see the Superior and uh, the Superior Volcarona those might be interesting ways to set up Co-Star Flamigo, but I think the bigger thing is the Ice Q. If you're bringing Ice Q to this set, you probably have Belly Drum on it. You're probably trying to set Flamigo up that way, which is a lot of fun if they can pull it off. Two possible Rage Powder users in Volcarona and Venonat. Venonat giving possible redirection support to all different kinds of setup on this team. Gives them a very dynamic offensive game plan, at least from the look of it. Um, and then the Palmet can revive something, of course, and it can also get fake out support and the like. On the Lancer's side, hmm. So it's the offensive duo of Salamence and Crawdont again. We've seen that they can be very powerful together, um, just do a lot of damage to things. Haunter is a special attacker. Um, I really wasn't very impressed with the Crabominable last time I saw it, and it doesn't even have snow support this time. At least it doesn't look like it does. So I don't know what they're planning with that, but we'll see if they bring it. Um, and then the Alchemy, so I see Alchemy and I think Decorate. Last time they brought Alchemy, it actually ran like a, an Acid Armor Combine set and kind of swept. But I think Decorate is still something that uh, Robbie has to take seriously into any of, I mean, take your pick, Salamence, Crawdaunt, Haunter. And then they have the Indeedee to give some cover to their Pokemon as well with the Psychic Terrain and Follow Me. So two potential dynamic game plans. Um, I, I think they'll be feeling each other out in game one, and then we'll see the adjustments from there. But we've got Ndidi and Crawdont leading against Ice Q and Palmet. So Robbie may be going for the Belly Drum setup. The Palmet just throws off a double shock into Ndidi, wanting to get rid of that, I guess. If you're trying to set up Flamigo, that makes sense to me. Ice Q gets its Belly Drum. But wait, 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 whoa, hold on. Mirror Herb Crawdont gets the plus four attack as well as the Indeedee sets Trick Room. All right, so let's take that in. So Palmet went right for the double shock into Indeedee, but it didn't KO, and they failed to deny the Trick Room while their other Pokemon was the Ice Q setting up. And I don't know, did 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 the Lancers specifically prep for this? I guess they know that. I guess, like, you just know that there's a lot of stat boosting on the other side. If you can get the slower Pokemon in the Trick Room, it's a great offensive setup. But did they prep specifically for Belly Drum? Or at least lead for it? Like, did they see the Ice Q at preview and go, yeah, Mirror Herb Crawdont? That's an amazing tech. Of course, the Ice Q still has its Ice Face intact, but... Um... 
Now, Cronaut might be slower than Indeedee. It does have a lower base speed. So... It is. It might still be awkward to remove the Ice Q with the Ice Face still intact. Of course, it'll take no damage from the first physical attack that targets it. But... That Crawdon is looking like it could be a problem. As we see the Indeedee... Okay, yeah, that makes more sense than what I was saying. I was looking for a way to, for Indeedee to attack... But no, that doesn't work, because special attacks don't break the ice face. Yeah, so I was just dead wrong there. The correct play is what they did, which is to follow me with Ndidi and then break the ice face. But Venonat coming in means that unless it's Terror Grass Crawdaunt, it's susceptible to getting its attacks redirected too. And so we have redirection on both sides with the plus four physical attackers. This is something else. Uh, ooh, ice Spinner on the Ice Q clears the Psychic Terrain. Um, and while getting rid of the Ndidi, the Alchemy comes in and Terra Fire Alchemy, which means it's not Grass Crawdaunt. Venonat redirects one knockoff and then just drops to it. But the Alchemy goes right for Terra Blasted Ice Q. And it's just Palmet and Volcarona now against plus four Crawdaunt. Still two turns of Trick Room. They get the fake out now because the Psychic Terrain is gone. And actually Bug Buzz KOs the Crawdaunt. So I guess the Alchemy had to go for Fire Terra Blast to get rid of the Ice Q. Otherwise, Ice Q might stick around on the field too long and KO Crawdaunt. It does take away the opportunity to use whatever Crawdaunt's Terra type is. Probably something useful into this matchup, right? I don't know what the type is, but you can imagine they've covered for something with it. We don't get to see it here. Um, I think the Terra Fire play does make sense, but it, depending on Crawdaunt's Terra type, it might mean that... You know, it might be the cause of Crawdaunt dropping. And we'll see what the last Pokemon in the back is for the Lancers. Um, I think Salamence could close out this game for them, for sure. Uh, I'm not as certain that uh, Haunter or Crabominable can. They might just not have enough power on the field, depending on what they bring in. But it is the Salamence. Uh, makes sense. Salamence is pretty strong into Superior, uh, Volcarona. It's pretty strong into all of this team, except Ice Q. And you have the Crawdaunt helping with that. We see Terra Electric Pommet. Um, I believe it will now be able to click Double Shock as many times as it wants. If you Terrestrialize into the Electric type before you click Double Shock, you can do that. Um, it just, yeah, yeah, I think that's right. But, oh, it also turns off its Fairy Weakness. But the Volcarona's Heat Wave is not doing much. Um, kind of has to hope to burn the Salamence, I think. And... We don't see a Heat Wave burn. We also don't see a Flame Body burn. I think Salamence will just finish Palmet off here. Even though it resists uh, fi uh, flying after the Terror Electric, the Salamence just hits too hard. So that was a great game from the Lightning Lancers. The Crawdaunt tech was just incredible. And they positioned their board just right to clean things up afterward. Um, the Terra Fire Alchemy was also a very nice touch, but we'll see how big time Sand Rush adjusts in game two. As now we see Haunter and Crawdaunt leading for the Lancers against Superior and Ice Q for Sand Rush. So they're still going for the Ice Q stuff. Um, and the Crawdaunt is still there to cover for it, I guess. As Ice Q switches out to Venonat, Superior just protects on a knockoff. Haunter sets Trick Room. Honestly, didn't remember it gets that move. Um, but there we go, multiple Trick Room setters to make sure the Crawdaunt gets going. But Venonat is, yeah, the fastest Pokemon on the field now. And in apart from Rage Powder, Venonat, you can expect, is carrying some kind of status. Sleep Powder is the next most obvious move on it. Um, and of course, it could have Compound Eyes to make the Sleep Powder more accurate. So they did give Fast Sleep Powder to Sand Rush by doing that. Um, but I don't know that the Haunter going to sleep is that big a deal. Crawdaunt lands a knockoff into Superior. We still don't see Crawdaunt's Terra type, so it will just drop to a Leaf Storm there. I wouldn't bet that the crit mattered. Um, and we get Alchemy in, Terra Fire again. Just going for Calm Mind. Superior's plus two Dragon Pulse doesn't quite KO Haunter. And uh, Robbie is playing around the Trick Room pretty well here. Um, Superior protects, I guess, to cover for Haunter waking up, and then the Alchemy goes to sleep. And once again, we might see Sleep just make a setup mode too slow. The Venonat shows Nightshade to knock the Haunter out. That's a good tech. Venonat not having a lot of ways to do damage. But the Alchemy wakes up quickly. Terra Blast through the Superior. And now we get Ice Q versus Salamence. 
but the uh, Terra Fire Alchemy is still there as well. I don't think we've seen. Uh, it was Terra Electric Palm at last game. We have we haven't seen Ice Q's Terra type, but it just protects for now. Palmet takes a lot from that dual wing beat. Fakes it. Okay, Palmet fakes out the Alchemy. Um, dual wing beat breaks the ice face, but then only the second hit lands. It doesn't do that much. The ice cube goes right for belly drum, trading a ton of its HP. Well, I guess some back with the berry, but is ice cube going to close this thing out? Protects on the dual wing beat there. As Palmet throws off an ice punch into Salamence. So Salamence drops, and I guess Ice Cube will finish Alchemy off from here. Palmet drops the Terra Blast, but it doesn't matter, I think. As the Venonat comes back in. Venonat can redirect the Terra Blast, but it doesn't even need to as Ice Cube's liquidation. I don't think that crit mattered at plus six attack. Um, breaks through Alchemy. So. Yeah, so Robbie played well around the Trick Room in this game, and then. Used Ice Q as a late game win con instead of early game setup. We still haven't seen the Flamigo, so the Ice Q is just going for belly drums for itself at this point. The Terra Fire Alchemy is potentially an issue for it. Um, the Mirror Herb Crawdont is so funny. But Robbie got the positioning just right this game and switching the Venonat in and out so it could disrupt with Sleep Powder under Trick Room or Rage Powder outside of Trick Room uh, was also very strong. We never. I don't think we saw a Terra from Robbie this game. We still don't know the Ice Q's Terra type. We also still don't know the Crawdon's Terra type. So, plenty of surprises that both coaches could throw at each other in game three, as we see now how the Lancers adjust. It's Indeedee and Alchemy versus Superior and Palmet. So, no Ice Q and no Crawdon in the lead this time. Palmet switches right out to Venonat. Can't get fake out pressure in Psychic Terrain, of course, as Superior just throws a Leaf Storm at Alchemy and crits. Salamence is in now. The Alchemy is setting up Calm Mind. Venonat redirects a dual wing beat and actually survives it. Um, some good bulk there with, a, with an Eviolite, I assume. Dragon Pulse doesn't quite KO Salamence, as Alchemy is still setting up. Now it goes for the Fire Terra again. Ooh, it dodges a Leaf Storm. Oh, which is actually the Leaf Storm was targeting Salamence. But it misses, and Alchemy... The Fire Terror Blast has just been clutch uh, throughout this set. Superior drops to it, and now Robbie's last two Pokemon are Palmet and Ice Q again. We might finally see the Ice Q's Terra type, and we do, it's water. Of course, you can fake out flying types in Psychic Terrain, so Palmet takes advantage of that to get rid of the Salamence. The Ice Q just goes right for Liquidation into Alchemy, does a lot of damage, and gets a defense drop. Doesn't quite KO. Uh, the Terra Blast will finally not KO Ice Q with, after the Water Terra. But Crawdot is in now, which means the Belly Drum is just too dangerous to go for, I think. Palmet tries to get rid of Crawdot with the Double Shock, but Crawdot uh, protects, so the Mirror Herb threat is still there. Ice Q does knock out Alchemy. Um, but Indeedee's back in now, and that means Crawdont gets redirection support. The double shock goes into Indeedee. We know it doesn't KO. Indeedee does drop to the double target. Crawdont takes out Palmet, and Ice Q has shown... Well, we know it's only two attacks are Ice Spinner and Liquidation, because its other moves are Belly Drum and Protect. So it's Ice Q throwing off resisted attacks, but it does still have its Ice Face. It goes right for the Belly Drum, which will, of course will activate the Mirror Herb. But I guess Ice Q is just looking for the one-hit KO. Um, because it can't be... Or... Yeah, I guess it has to be, because it'll take an attack that'll break the Ice Face here. And it'll only get one more chance to attack after that. And it doesn't have Icicle Crash to flinch. I don't know if Robbie's all in on a crit or what, but... Because I'm not, I'm not confident that Ice Q gets the one-hit KO here. Liquidation does 82%. And then Ice Q drops the knockoff. Robbie went all in on one big attack and it didn't work out. Um, but that was a great back and forth set. I really enjoyed that a lot. Um, the Crawdont put in so much work there. But we move on now to um, Arctic Articunos versus Azure Bay Chadots. The Articunos already bring in their new Gudra to a set, which makes sense to cover. I mean, if you want Gudra for special bulk, up against Hatterene, Chandelure, Ludicolo. 
this is the first test of what it can do. Wouldn't be surprised if it has an assault vest or something. Uh, they still have the pairing of Sinistra and Ursaluna. They also have the Blastoise. I wonder whether it'll be something like a Shell Smash Blastoise with Sinistra, Redirection, and Healing Support. But yeah, so Sinistra and some big bulky Pokemon. Um, don't know what the muck is for, but it, I, maybe it's like Terra Steel cover for the Hatterene or a different Terra type covering for the Chandelure. The muck definitely has some matchups into this team, unless at least if it Terra's. And then the Tauros. This doesn't seem like a good Tauros matchup. Um, the Tauros is maybe for something that Chadots didn't bring, but we'll see. Um, Chadots bring Squawkabilly. So maybe we'll get to see that put in some work. And then Ludicolo with no obvious rain setter. Maybe Squawkabilly gets rain danced. Also brought another water type in Gyarados. And it looks like they're going for some Trick Room stuff, probably, with two very good Trick Room setters in Hatterene Chandelure and King Gambit to uh, take advantage of it as well, which I guess then means maybe you want Slow Ludicolo, but we'll find out. Maybe you don't want to set up Swift Swim is the, the end of that thought. It's Sinistra Blastoise lead against Squawkabilly Gyarados. Blastoise has a white herb, so I think that tips their hand that it is Shell Smash Blastoise. Sinistra just goes for Terra Water. Blastoise says Fake Out. Okay. Not what I'd expect on a Shell Smash set. Um, as Squawkabilly sets Tailwind. Okay, so it's a Tail Room team. It's not Hard Trick Room. Makes sense. Sinistra going for Combine, so... It looked like the Sinistra was here to support the Blastoise in setting up, but so far Blastoise is supporting Sinistra. The Squawkabilly getting off a parting shot, though, is pretty funny. And the Gyarados goes right for Outrage. So Outrage, of course, you're locked in for two to three turns, and in doubles, you can't pick your target. I I, I think it's random. So the Gyarados making kind of a risky play there with the Outrage, but it does get big damage into the Sinistra. And Squawkabilly has brought in Ludicolo, which can now threaten both of these water types with the Grass Stab. Blastoise throwing off Muddy Water, fishing for an Accuracy Drop, maybe. And I think this is... I think this might not be Shell Smash Blastoise. Uh, it can still be Shell Smash, Muddy Water, and like another attack and no protect. It's possible. But Sinistra is the one trying to deliver the offense this time. Uh, but now it switches out in the face of the Ludicolo. We see the Gudra. If it's Sap Sipper Gudra, then it might get set up from a grass attack here. But Ludicolo just fakes out the Blastoise. Gudra drops to the Outrage. The Gyarados is going wild with Outrage. Um, that's a very risky but fun tech that's paying off so far. As Gyarados breaks through confusion and does a ton of damage to Blastoise with Outrage, Sinistra dodges... Okay, because of the accuracy drop on Ludicolo, it dodges, uh, Giga Drain. Good news for Sinistra there. But it looks like the, the Articunas are just getting overwhelmed, especially by this Outrage Gyarados. So just now stacking up Moxie boosts and still just throwing off Outrage into pretty much the best target every turn. Some amount of luck in that, I think, but it's a lot of fun to watch. As the Blood Moon or Saluna almost drops to a plus two Outrage and the Hydro Pump finishes it off. So, I mean, that was really the difference maker in that game. I mean, the Squawkability and Ludicolo played their parts too, but the Outrage Gyarados was just too much to deal with. I almost wonder whether you bring Tauros next game to cover for it. But I don't know, I don't think the Tauros is very good in this matchup for the most part. And I don't know that just trying to nerf Gyarados Outrage is really worth it. I mean, there are other ways that the Outrage could not pay off. I think you don't switch Gudra in on an Outrage and Gyarados again. It could work, but hopefully you have a Terra type on Gudra that can help you deal with this. Um, I can see Terra Steel in the face of the Hatterene. Um, <laughs> but yeah, when Gudra just went down like that, and then Sinistra couldn't get set up safely. I don't know if it works a second time, but we'll see what adjustment Trico comes up with. Blazebreed Tauros is here with Sinistra against Squawkabilly and Ludicolo. Okay. Tauros just protects. I mean, yeah, the, again, the problem with Tauros is you can intimidate the Gyarados, but I don't know that it's good for much else in this matchup. And it just switches out here as Sinistra gets the Calm Mind, goes Terra Water. Takes a parting shot in Tailwind. Very like last game, even with the Gyarados getting in next to Ludicolo here. But Gudra takes that Hydro Pump well. 
The Gudra cannot terrestrialize because the Sinistra has, so better hope it doesn't take an Outrage. Ah, uh, but we see the Rage Powder redirect the Outrage. It does a lot of damage to Sinistra, though. And Sinistra, Sinistra feels like it's in a bad spot here because it's trying to set up and probably trying to deliver offense in the end, but now it's also trying to support Gudra. But, okay, the Gudra is setting up Acid Armor. If it can take an Outrage now, then... You know, I see the vision. I think Trico is playing in kind of a flexible way, where multiple Pokémon are able to set up and try to win the game, and other Pokémon are able to support... It's like... How do I put this? Trico has multiple Pokémon with setup, and some of them also have support options. So, Trico is able to pivot and switch to a different mode mid-game to try to win. So here we saw the Gudra start, or we saw the Sinistra start setting up, the Gyarados started rolling with Outrage again, the Gudra can't terrestrialize because the Sinistra already has, but now the Sinistra is switching to supporting the Gudra as the Gudra tries to get his defense high enough. Um, it walls Ludicolo, at least it, it looks like it does so far. If it can get enough bulk that it doesn't have to worry about the Gyarados, and eventually the Gyarados will get confused and maybe hurt itself if it keeps trying to attack, then maybe Gudra can win the game. So it's an interesting game plan, we'll see if it works out. Um, I just realized the Tauros doesn't have Intimidate, does it? No, it doesn't. I just assumed that it did. I didn't even notice turn one. So I really don't know then why you bring Tauros to this game. I don't know what else Tauros brings to this matchup. I mean, Trico must have a plan if they're doing this, but we'll see. Gudra protects on the Outrage here. Tauros does take that Giga Drain nicely. Gyarados is still not confused. Ah, the Tauros has Wild Charge and knocks out the Gyarados. Okay, there it is. The Gyarados will not be spamming Outrage anymore. Tauros takes it out with Wild Charge. Sludge Bomb does decent damage to Ludicolo. Honestly, not great damage. Tauros drops for Hydro Pump, but I think you're happy with that trade if you're Trico. Um, Ursa Luna's in a tough spot, though, against Ludicolo. Again, with no Terra available, as the Tailwind goes right back up and Ursaluna drops to a Hydro Pump. But I think at this point, Trico has to be trying to win the game with Gudra. Uh, the Gudra has shown Acid Armor, Protect, and Sludge Bomb. We don't know its last move. It might be a slow win con, but it might work. I don't think Sinistra is too bothered about taking a parting shot here. Oh, is the Chandelure is in the back. That could be an issue for Gudra. I mean, Gudra is especially bulky, but of course, the Acid Armor... To and the Ludicolo shows Ice Beam. Oh, it showed Ice Beam once already, I guess. But, yeah, the combination of Chandelure and Ice Beam Ludicolo, especially with Ludicolo not getting two hit KO'd by the Sludge Bomb, I think Gudra is just going to get overwhelmed here. I think there was... I think I saw the vision for a world where it could win the game. I had Body Press as his last move. So, yeah, if, like, King Gambit had been in the back, Gudra could have put in a lot of work. But it's been softened up quite a bit by those ice beams. Ah, you know what? <clears throat> there might still be a chance. But Mario Man gets speed control again. Oh, the Chandel Oh, but the Gudra only has Sludge Bomb and Body Press to attack, so it's barely doing any damage into the Chandelure. No, I think Gudra just loses the Chandelure from here. Um, and everything that could threaten the Chandelure. Right, the Ursa Luna couldn't get past the Ludicolo, the Blastoise didn't even come to this game after the Ludicolo was a problem for it. So Chandelure just cleans up very nicely. Uh, solid play by Mario Man, keeping Chandelure in the back until its threats were gone. And just overwhelming the Gudra. So Trico, I think pivoting between different flexible game plans there was an interesting approach, but it just doesn't work out against all these powerful threats. And of course, especially the Outrage Gyarados in Game 1, which I just can't get over. Um, but that's it for this set. And now we move on to uh, Melodic Miraidon versus Marvelous Bridge Malamars. The defending champ returning after a, uh, after a forfeit last week, bringing an interesting mix of Two very cute bugs in Rabombi and Vivion. Two um, dangerous fighting types in Sneasler and Gallade. And then the Dragapult and the Glamora. Um, I don't know what this team... I mean, the Dragapult-Sneasler duo is pretty well established at this point. The Dragapult can play its U-turn game, get Sneasler in, maybe get Glamora in, get Toxic Spikes up or Immortal Spin. 
Uh, the Robombi can run... Well, I was going to say it can run Sticky Web if it wants, but it also just gets Tailwind and can't be faked out. Vivion also gets Tailwind, but Vivion... It could be here for Rage Powder, but actually I think Vivion... It wouldn't shock me if it's a Quiver Dance attacker on this team. Because the opponent has, again, uh, has, uh, as I've mentioned, six dark types. They brought three this week. Um, and then some bulky psychic types like the Slowbro. I actually think Vivion could do a lot of damage if it gets going with Quiver Dance. So that might be what they have in mind. On the Malamar side... <clears throat> hmm. Well, you got plenty of threats into Dragapult. Uh, the Malamar isn't even that afraid of the Sneasler. And you also have Slowbro and Metagross to help you cover for that. So they have a lot of answers to the two most threatening, most obviously threatening Pokemon on the other side. The bulky Psychic types could also be trouble for Gallade. Of course, Gallade can run Sharpness Boosted Night Slash or something. Honestly, Gallade might be able to sweep this team if the circumstances are right, but they'll probably have some Terra type to cover for that and also just throw a bulk at it like Slowbro. Um, so yeah, the... Stacking up on Dark and Psychic types does make a lot of sense this week. I'm not sure what the Gradient is here for. I mean, they definitely could have a Trick Room, mo trick room mode with that, Slowbro, Bisharp. So maybe the Gradient just wants to get going with Belly Drum or something. But, yeah, we'll, have, we'll just have to get into it and see. As we see Metagross and Meowskarada lead against Dragapult and Gallade. Dragapult does go right for that U-turn, it just KOs Meowskarada. It's Vivian in. But Vivion drops to an Ice Punch, so we don't get to see this game what it can do. Gallade sets Trick Room. Gallade sets Trick Room. Sneasler in the back. Dragapult. Against Greedent and Metagross. Of course, the Greedent has just come in now, and maybe Think Boy didn't know that the, the uh, Vivion was going to get one shot. But I don't see what I, I don't see what he's doing with this Trick Room. Um, that seems to benefit his opponent, but we'll keep watching and see. Terra Normal Greedent just going for big damage, I guess. It is faced with two fighting types, so okay, no setup, just body slam. Um, of course, the Paralysis will make the Sneasler slower. And Glade. It's getting to throw off attacks with impunity so far. I mean, it Trick Room to turn one, but then yeah, that Sacred Sword just takes Greedent out. I do think that Greedent... <coughs> The Greedent is the thing I least understand in the Malamar's game plan, and it did just drop against the two fighting types there. They pressured out the Terra, so it could do as much damage as it could without setting up. It still wasn't enough. The Prowls, I mean, the Sneasler is gone now, but the Greedent couldn't one-shot it, and Gallade was free to just take Greedent out. I don't think you bring Greedent to game two, but I don't know. We'll see. But yeah, they get Slowbro in in Trick Room now, and I still don't understand... Like, maybe there's some... Oh, the freeze is funny. Maybe there's some tech with the Vivion. But I don't understand the Trick Room play. It seems to only benefit the other team. Okay, the freeze, but then Dragapult thaws immediately. Burns Metagross. But Glade also being burned. There's a lot of pressure on the Miraidon. As they stall out the last turn of their own Trick Room. Metagross went for Ice Punch there, so it probably doesn't have Bullet Punch. Gallade can finish it off. Gallade is still doing a lot of damage for being burned. And two very low HP Pokemon, but the Slowbro just takes too much from that U-turn. Uh, so that was a close game. Um, I think there might be a way that the Slowbro could have won it. Again, Terrasalizing the Greedent, just, there was so much opportunity cost in that. I don't know what the Slowbro's Terra type is, but maybe it could have given it the res the the resistances or at least non-weaknesses that it needed to close this out but maybe we'll find out in game two um as that was kind of an odd game from the miradon but it pays off for them so far uh with Gallade putting in a ton of work against the opposing dark types and the normal type greedent Gallade is a serious problem for the malamars in this matchup and it showed it in game one but in game two, we see Robombi now leading with Vivion. I hope we get to see the Vivion do something. It's just Rage Powder for now, as the Robombi sets up with Quiver Dance. That's right, they do both get Quiver Dance, and I guess Robombi is the stronger attacker. 
I don't know why I didn't think of that at preview. But yeah, the Vivion is just spamming Rage Powder. It does drop here on turn two. The Malamar will take a ton from Pollen Puff. Yeah, into the double weakness. It does survive with a Focus Sash. Um, Trick Room is up. This time it was the team that benefits from Trick Room that set it up. And they're in position to do some damage here. But the Rabombi is a problem as it takes two attacks there and knocks out the Slowbro with Pollen Puff. And yeah, I said earlier that loading up on Dark and Psychic types I could understand in this matchup, but it does open up a big weakness to the opponent's bug types, and the Rabombi is taking full advantage here, as Gallade also reverses the Trick Room. Maybe that's what um, Think Boy was trying to do in Game 1. I kind of ruled it out because the uh, Malamar's lead in Game 1 was Meowskarada, Metagross. There's not really an obvious Trick Room setter there compared to Slowbro, but Meowskarada can set Trick Room. I don't necessarily know that you want to because Meowskarada doesn't then benefit from it, but people have used it in VGC as a Trick Room setter. So maybe Think Boy predicted a Trick Room there and got it wrong, but this time Think Boy is able to reverse the Trick Room. Um, the Rubombi is just going to protect itself this turn. Gallade can just take out Bisharp with Sacred Sword. Um, and then, I don't think the Metagross has Bullet Punch, so yeah, Dazzling Gleam finishes off Malamar, chips the Metagross, Sacred Sword. Oh my, Gallade is just such a strong Pokemon, man. <laughs> it just, it just, Metagross is just gone. Um, yeah, so, the Gallade was kind of the big piece in this game, um, being able to just throw off so much damage. Um, the Malamars didn't bring a f well, they're only they brought one fighting resist, it was Slowbro. They brought a few fighting weaknesses, and the Glade Sacred Sword with sharpness just does so much damage. <laughs> but then also, yeah, their team was pretty bug weak, um, this time around, and the Rabombi took advantage in game two, um, which is which is fun. I like to see Rabombi putting in a lot of work, but what did they do with their Terra this game? I don't think they used it. Hmm. Yeah. They they I think they needed some kind of Terra type to cover for the bugs on the other side. And you also have to watch over the fighting types. You probably don't want to run like Terra Steel. Maybe you can run Terra Poison on something. Actually, Terra Poison on something could be pretty strong into a lot of this team. But eh, it's something to think about if they meet in playoffs. We'll move on now to um the Dallas Dragapults versus Varsity Farm Boys. The Dragapults bringing their rain mode with Pelipper, Basque Legion, and Overquill. Of course, we've seen that the Overquill can be very flexible in exactly what set it runs. It does not necessarily running a Swift Swim attacking set. Then we see Halucha Rillaboom, probably with the Grassy Seed combo again. And then we see Altaria, which I really don't know what that's here to do. Of course, it gets Cloud9, so it can turn off weather. Maybe it's an emergency button, but if you're playing a weather team yourself, you're probably fighting for weather control. But Altaria does have a very good support move pool, stuff like Will-O-Wisp, Sing. It could even set up on the Ursa Luna with Cotton Guard, so maybe that's something like that is what they're going for. Cotton Guard, of course, giving it plus three defense in one turn. But it is gonna, if it is going for something like that, it'll have trouble with the Garganackle. On the other hand, the Garganackle has trouble with like, all of these four Pokemon. <laughs> so it's going to take some very solid positioning to use that well in this matchup. Farm Boys have brought both of their weathers from the looks of it. I mean, the Politoed doesn't have to be setting rain. I think the Ninetales definitely is running drought, because I don't know what else you do with Ninetales. And also the Vile Plume probably needs the Chlorophyll support, and also it gives them an answer to the opponent's rain. The Politoed, I could honestly see it not running Drizzle, and just having some kind of crazy text to uh, counter this team. I don't know, Politoed is an interesting move pool. There are a few different things it could be doing. Do you, do you really run it without Drizzle? I don't know. We'll find out. Um, and then the Ursa Luna is just always an offensive threat, but kind of hard to pull off into Basque Legion, Pelipper, Halucha, Rillaboom. And then the Ambipom is going to bring Fake Out support, U-Turn, maybe some other support moves. It could run Manual Weather. It could run Speed Control. Um, yeah, I don't... The Garganackle and the Ursa Luna both seem hard to use in this matchup. Maybe you run an Ambipom, Ninetales, Vileplume, Ursaluna game plan, but 
I don't know. There's a ton of pressure on this team, and I don't know how they're going to deal with it. As we see, Ambipalm Ninetales lead against Overquill and Basque Legion. There's the Drought. It is Intimidate Overquill again, and it's going to go right out to Pelipper, so Basque Legion can start uh, popping off. Of course, Basque Legion can't be faked out, and it... Pelipper doesn't really care about the fake out that turn. Basque Legion takes out the Ambipalm with Flip turn. That's a pretty good turn for the Dragapults. They get Rillaboom in on an Energy Ball. It's just a ton of momentum going the Dragapult's way so far. Vileplume is in, but it doesn't have its weather. It does have Terra Electric. Takes that Hurricane pretty nicely, and is it just gonna Terra Blast the Pelipper? No, okay. It Energy Balls the Pelipper, knocks it out. I guess the Electric Terra is just for the Flying Resist. Or they thought Pelipper might Terra. But Energy Ball takes Pelipper out, so Farm Boys can have Weather Control if they want. But now they can't, because Ninetales is KO'd. Or, excuse me, Vileplume is KO'd, so Ninetales can't switch out. But Ninetales has Sunny Day. Wait. These <laughs> these plays are going by too quickly. Ninetales has Sunny Day, so it does take Weather Control, but then it drops to High Horsepower for Rillaboom. And the offense from the Dragapults, with the Basque Legion Flip turning in and out, and then the Rillaboom throwing off big hits... Um, it looks like it's just too much for the farm boys to handle here. Ursaluda comes in. I, I can't see it winning this game. Just Terra flying over Quill on top of everything else. As the Ursaluna, yeah, it just has super effective attacks flying at it. Uh, Liquidation is, of course, non stab and nerfed by the sun, but the wood hammer in grassy terrain from Rillaboom just does so much damage. And yeah, that was just an offensive clinic by the Dragapults um, with. Their Rillaboom and Rain Attacker is just completely overwhelming the Farm Boys like I thought they might uh, when I saw the matchup at preview. We'll see what the Farm Boys have to adjust for that. It starts with Garganacle and Politoed against Halucha Basque Legion. Politoed not running Drizzle. Garganacle, maybe it'll Terra now and and uh, that'll give it some some durability, but it looks like it's in a tough spot. The Basque Legion showing the Stellar Terra is interesting. As it just goes for flip turn into a Protect, we don't see the Terra from Garganacle so far. Basque Legion takes a Muddy Water, but no Accuracy Drop, and there it is. Terra, Dragon, Garganacle. Could actually put in a lot of work wearing down the opposing team, although the plus two Halucha. No Grassy Seed, by the way. They don't have that combo. The Halucha is at plus two. Oh, but so is the Garganacle with the Iron Defense. The Garganacle might be harder to break than I thought in this game. But Holucha targeting correctly into the Politoed doesn't KO. Does drop its own special defense. Takes a lot of damage from the Muddy Water. Basque Legion takes the Accuracy drop. And the Muddy Water Politoed quietly doing a lot to support the Garganacle and getting set up. And after the slugfest of the last game here, both players are positioning carefully, kind of feeling each other out. The Ninetales gets in now to take weather control away. Takes a close combat with its Focus Sash. Garganacle takes a lot from Hurricane. But it's going to start spreading Salt Cure now. And of course Hurricane can miss in Sun. Which is probably why Pelipper switches out to get the rain back. And Farm Boy's just careful of protecting. Get Vile Plume in in Sun. But not anymore. The Crit Last Respects takes out Vile Plume, but I don't think Vile Plume is that important at this point. I think the Garganacle, which has now recovered up to full, is threatening to win the whole game. If they don't find an answer to it. That last respect's just did 10%. And Basque Legion got salt cured. I think you have to switch Basque Legion out and honestly sack something to get more last respects damage. But then the Hurricane is probably their best thing into the Garganacle, so sacking Pelipper isn't much of a solution. Sacking Rillaboom is just hard to do in this position. It's just not the obvious target for the Garganacle's attacks. So Garganacle really has them in a pinch here. Nine tail KOing nine tails is good for their weather control. But Basque Legion takes so much and is salt cured now. And it just drops. Salt cure damage is I haven't used Garganacle in a while. I forgot how much damage salt cure does. 
but losing Basque Legion might mean losing the game. Hurricane can, can confuse, so that could be an out. But nope, not this time. And Garganacle can just protect. There's nothing to switch in, so Pelipper will be KO'd by the Salt Cure, and I think Garganacle beats Rillaboom from there. And the Dragapults tried. They pivoted around a lot with uh, Basque Legion and Pelipper, looking to set up a strong combination of attacks to take down the Garganacle, but it didn't work out this game. And... I'm not sure how they're going to try to break it in Game 3, but it's shown that... You know, I said that the Farm Boys team is under a lot of pressure from the Dragapults, but Terra Dragon, Iron Defense, Garganacle has proven to be the exception. So, yeah, they better have a good plan to break it in Game 3, because it's definitely coming back. I think the Farm Boys have to bring it and try to just win the game with it again. And we'll see if it works for them. As it is Garganacle and Ambipalm against Hawlucha and Rillaboom. Ambipalm can fake something out. Garganacle goes out to Ninetales. Big fake out into Hawlucha. But Hawlucha has the Covert Cloak and knocks out Ambipalm. Okay, and the Farm Boy is positioning Garganacle carefully again, not ripping the Terra Dragon right away. Um, I guess probably not relying on the flinch on Halucha there. Making sure that they can get it in relatively safely here. Halucha shows the fighting Terra. Garganacle ta just takes a close combat. Did they think Halucha would switch out? Did they think that they can just go for Iron Defense, it doesn't matter. I don't know why they didn't tear a dragon there. I don't see anything that threatens it. Hmm. Still no Terra. Well, it's, just, it's okay, it protects now, so that's fine. Rillaboom takes out Nine Tails. Again, choosing, reading the Protect and choosing its target correctly, as it makes sense. The Garganacle wants the hip recovery. There finally is the Dragon Terra. And Garganacle is able to take close combat. And a wood hammer. It's close, but that protect into grassy terrain recovery did make the difference there. Gargoyle Hackle has to go for recover here, and it does. So it's been dicey, but it seems to be getting going now. As we see the Basque Legion. Rillaboom is. Rillaboom is the Pokemon least threatened by the Garganacle. Because it's not frail like Halucha, and it's not weak to Salt Cure like the water types. We don't know that Pelipper is in the back. I think it probably is, since we saw the Basque Legion. So Rillaboom is able to just pick off... I mean, Halucha took out, took out the Ambipalm. Rillaboom has been able to just pick off Ninetales and Politoed. And all of a sudden, it's a, a four-on-one with just the Garganacle. So it all so the whole set comes down to, can the Dragapults break the Terra Dragon Iron Defense Garganacle? Um, but they can pivot around Salt Cure and throw off attacks into it pretty safely now. I, it might make a difference that the Farm Boys, or the Rillaboom can just keep attacking while Salt Cured. It might make a difference that the Farm Boys don't have anything to pivot into their other slot. Because we do see the Pelipper come in now. I wonder whether the Altaria... Part of me wondered whether the Altaria had a tech for the Dragon Garganacle, being a Dragon type itself. But maybe not, since we're not going to see it in this set. Alucha going right for the setup, but yeah, yeah, the farm boys can't turn off the rain anymore because they let Nine Tails go down to Rillaboom. So Hurricane does a ton of damage now to Garganacle. Um, I actually thought Garganacle would protect there, maybe force Pelipper to switch out or get knocked out, but I guess they realized that was too slow with Halucha setting up Sword Stance. Its boosts were already outpacing Garganacle's boosts, so they just had to go for it, and it meant that Pelipper could take the Garganacle out with Hurricane. So. Game 1, Farm Boys tried a different mode, Dragapults overwhelmed them, as I kind of thought they would at preview. Game 2, Terra Dragon, Garganacle, um, was just too difficult for the Dragapults to break and wore the team down. Game 3, Dragapults kept up the pressure, the Garganacle took a bit of time to get going, and in the meantime the Dragapults were able to set up to KO all of its teammates, so the Garganacle stood alone, and it just couldn't handle the, the duo of Pelipper and Halucha by itself. Um, strong set on both ends. A lot of fun to watch. And we move on now to... 
Um, Miami Palafins versus Moville Mudkips. The Palafins have their new Pokemon, Hisui and Lilligant, already here in this matchup. They have Klefki Archaladon, Persian Archaladon. There could be something setting up rain. If they have Sunny Day, I think Persian gets Sunny Day. I don't know if Klefki does. They also could go for that with uh, the Lilligant and the Cinderace coming to this set. And we also might get a chance to see what the Cryogonal can do. On the Mudkip side, um, they have three ground types. Uh, they have their pretty, they have their pretty typical well-rounded team that they've been bringing so far this season. The duo of Town Flame and Garchomp, the Fairy Dragon Steel Core with Garchomp, Scizor, and uh, Gardevoir. They have multiple po Pokemon that can spam Earthquake next to Talon Flame, which could be an issue for our Chaldon and Cinderace, but not so much for Hisui and Lilligant. They'll have to cover for that somehow. Maybe they have uh, Terra Poison or something on some Pokemon. But also the Scizor can threaten Lilligant with Bullet Punch. The Guard of War is a bit of a wild card, but it can be an offensive threat into our Chaladon as a special attacker. Um, it has a good type matchup into Lilligant. So I see a few different game plans that either player could go for, but we'll see. I do like the Mudkip's offensive threats into this matchup, though, as we see Talonflame and Crocodile lead against Persian and Cryogonal. Persian is threatening a fake out. There's, there could easily be a Covert Cloak on one of these, but... Hey, if, if the Palfins call it right, then that could be very disruptive. And the Cryogonal is a, an offensive threat. I didn't really talk about it, but it is an offensive threat to all three ground types. Um, even Swampert, of course, being weak to Freeze Dry. It does have to watch out for Talonflame, which could be carrying Flare Blitz, and for um, Scizor, but maybe a Terra's around that. The Cryogonal could actually be a very swingy piece in this matchup. Um, as I say that, and it immediately takes a ton of damage from the knockoff. And <laughs> goes for Ancient Power into Talonflame. So there's an anti-Talonflame tech for you. Um, the Talonflame does not have a Covert Cloak. It won't be getting Tailwind up this game because it's made to flinch, and then it takes an Ancient Power. And I would... I would be excited right now if uh, Cryogonal got the Ancient Power boost. But of course, it's only 10%, I think. Oh, and the Scizor forces it out now anyway. It's still a fun boost to fish for, though, if you get the chance. Icy Wind from the Persian will slow the Crocodile. This is our Chaldon comes in. If our Chaldon has stamina, it does. It gets the boost from that Scizor U-turn there. And they're probably reading a Bullet Punch and looking for a really safe boost from that. Terra flying our Chaldon now. Garchomp having to protect around Persians. Um, Icy Wind. Now Persian just... Okay, Persian knows it's dropping a Bullet Punch, so it just... Uh, Lends its support to our Chaladon with one last helping hand. Our Chaladon takes that scale shot very well with only two hits. Nope. More than two hits. I just got confused by the stamina text. Still takes it pretty well. It just takes out Garchomp with a Draco Meteor. Our Chaladon now at plus five defense. And Hisui and Lilligant is in. It'll be the fastest Pokemon on the field. It might have to watch out for Scizor though as okay it takes a bullet punch probably knock out crocodile if it wants instead it just goes for pollen puff into our chaladon i didn't consider that but that does make a lot of sense hisui and lilligant that is one a big thing hisui and lilligant can do that conkelder can't is help keep the archaladon healthy and crocodile knocks out lilligant to get some moxie boost but it's too little too late as denying tailwind was pretty big for the palafins there in that game, but also getting their child on set up, and so far Mudkips haven't shown anything that can deal with that. But we'll see what they have in game two. As it's Crocodile Gardevoir lead against our child on leading this time with Klefki. They go right for the Terras on both sides, the Fire Gardevoir and the Flying our child on, which nicely avoids uh, the Earthquake. Of course, something I didn't mention but three different Pokemon that could spam Earthquake and Tailwind next to Talonflame. They can also do it next to Gardevoir because of Telepathy. The Earthquake doesn't even do that much to the Klefki, but with Mystical Fire and the Fire Terra, it knocks it out. If the Klefki... I don't know if the Klefki was setting up Rain this time. Well, it was just going for screens, I guess. But Lilligant, yeah, it won't take much from a resisted Earthquake in... 
deflect. Putting the Gardevoir to sleep there is pretty clutch. Mudkip's already getting worn down again by the Archaladon. They do get Tailwind this time. The Gardevoir wakes up quickly, which is good for it. Cryogonal's back. Talonflame goes for Sunny Day, and the Terra Fire Mystical Fire just takes out Cryogonal. Wow. The Terra Fire Garchomp is just going wild here. The Lilligant protects. I don't know if it has... That did so much to our child on, too. I don't know if the Lilligant has um, Chlorophyll. I guess it's facing so many offensive threats, even if it does, that... It makes sense to protect and take one of them out. The body press. Our Chaladon took so much damage. Lilligant can't heal it. Unless it gets taken out by Sun Boosted. Flare Blitz in the opponent's Tailwind. And Garchomp. Scale Shot is giving a lot of boost to our Chaladon, but it doesn't matter. Our Chaladon is so low. Even if it survives this, yeah, it's not going to take... It's probably not going to take another hit. It's already lowered its own special attack, so the Draco Meteor doesn't KO Garchomp. I bet Talonflame just knocks it out here. Nope, Garchomp is faster after the scale shot, so it gets to knock our Chaladon out. Um, yeah, and so the Cryogonal, Lilligant, just got overwhelmed there. Do not, we see why denying Tailwind in Game 1 was huge, because this game they got the Tailwind up, and then the Talonflame was faster than the Lilligant, and the Lilligant just didn't get any chance to heal our Chalodon. So, game three might come down to the Tailwind as well. One way to find out, and that's to watch. As we see Scizor and Talonflame lead against Persian and Cryogonal. Persian probably trying to deny the Tailwind again, but you've already shown the Ancient Power attack. Persian actually fakes out Scizor this time. They go for Ancient Power into Crocodile. Don't get the boost. It'd be pretty cool if they got the boost, but instead, the Cryogonal is synergizing pretty nicely with the Archaladon, Archaladon in this matchup as Cryogonal is pressured out by Scizor, but then Archaladon gets a very easy and free stamina boost if Scizor does attack into that slot. The Crocodile showing close combat, knocking the Persian down with Sash, but that means Crocodile... Yeah, its defenses are nerfed. It takes a lot from Persian's Icy Wind. Uh, not quite KO'd by a feint. So Persian goes down here. Mudkips can still get Tailwind up. They do lose Crocodile, though. But they can get Tailwind up with Garchomp or something now. Okay, it's Gardevoir is the last Pokemon. Terra Fire Gardevoir again. Showed that, it's how, showed that it can be extremely dangerous to this Archaladon that doesn't have a way to resist fire. And they get the Tailwind up, so the Lilligant is again pressured by Talonflame plus Gardevoir, both throwing off strong fire attacks. Probably won't get a chance to keep Archaladon healthy. Does put Gardevoir to sleep, and Gardevoir only takes 50% from Draco Meteor. Our Chaladon is switching out here. Cryogonal is not going to be helpful into dual fire types. No, it just drops to a Flare Blitz. And... Yeah, the Lilligant is just too pressured again under Tailwind. In fact, the Brave Bird can take it out as well. Yeah. And Mystical Fire finishes our Chaladon off. And that was a just a sweep there by the Mudkips. So I talked up the ground types at preview, and that's probably, if you're their opponent, that's probably what you see as well. Three ground types, lots of opportunity for Earthquake spam. In a different matchup, it would be interesting. But after the Terra flying our child on one game one with the Lilligant keeping it healthy, they adjusted super well. Um, they were denied the Tailwind in game one, but they got it up in both of the other two games using Talonflame, uh, you know, a, a little bit later, not tr just going for it turn one. And then the dual fire types with the Talonflame and the Terra Fire Gardevoir. Um, Briogonal isn't is a good, strong answer to the ground types, but it does nothing to the dual fire types. It just gets KO'd. Lilligant just gets KO'd under Tailwind. Um, our Chaladon didn't have a way to resist fire. There was never any rain set up in this set. And even if there was, the Talonflame had Sunny Day. So pivoting away from the ground types really exposed the lack of answers to this other mode on the other side. I wonder whether the Cinderace might have been able to do something. But well, we never saw it come to a game. Maybe because it was afraid of the triple ground. So I talked about this being a well-rounded team that at the same time could pull off ground spam. But yeah, they really had multiple layers of offense that opened up a lot of different game plans that were hard to deal with altogether. So good team building there from the Mudkips. Two sets left, and we start with Flatland, Flat Sands versus Ceaseless Samurots. 
Flat Sands have brought... Uh, okay, so I see Whimsicott and Mudsdale, so it could be beat up stamina stuff. Um, Whimsicott can set Tailwind. They can also set Trick Room if they want. It's a little harder for that for it to pull that one off. Uh, we got the Clefable, the Haunch Crow, the Cleavor. I don't necessarily know what the game plan is. Uh, the Cleavor's rock coverage is good into a lot of what Samurots have here, though. Um, yeah, we'll just play it out and see. Uh, the Clefable is strong into, like, Hisui and Samurott and um, low kicks. On the Samurott side, I mean, the Samurott's team I've talked up a bunch as a team full of Pokemon that I know are interesting but I'm not experienced with and don't necessarily understand. Uh, the Salazzle with fake out pressure and general pressure into the fairy types could do a lot in this set. I think Hisui and Samurott is still dangerous to the other side, even if they try to set something up, maybe with the Mudsdale for it. Um, we've seen the Flat Sands do well with boosting strategies, so the Skeledurge makes sense to ignore those with Unaware. But yeah, I don't know. Oh, and they have their Tailwind threat as well, Kilowattrol. I don't know what either game plan is looking at preview. Let's just get into it. As we see Salazzle and Low Kicks lead against Whimsicott and Cleavor. Or Bug Low Kicks. They fake out into Whimsicott and First Impression KOs. The Cleavor gets a Stone Axe into Salazzle, knocking it down to its Sash. I think you're okay with that trade if you're the Samurots. Um, the Clefable comes in already. This goes right for Follow Me, as the Cleavor is trying to do the damage here. Now with Dual Wing Beat into the Low Kick slot, still does a lot to Samurott. Clefable takes a lot from Salazzle's Sludge Bomb, but is able to finish Salazzle off. And of course, Low Kicks now has to take Stealth Rock damage when it comes back in. They go hard to Mudsdale. Doesn't take the first impression as well as I might expect. And Samurots are getting some damage now with these strong, sometimes super effective attacks, but Flat Sands are getting KOs, is the difference. Thunderbolt for Igarath into the Terra Flying Cleavor is interesting, but Cleavor protects on it. Mudsdale shows the Chesto Rest. Um. Yeah, Lokix cannot use First Impression. Is Lokix banded or something? Oh yeah, it's just been using First Impression on not its first turn. So it's just a useless slot now that two of its teammates are gone. So yeah, the Flat Sands picking up those quick KOs really does make a difference. They completely neutralize the Lokix, and the Ferrigraph I don't think can win this game by itself. No, it's just getting worn down. It's not a super exciting end game, but very solid one for the Flat Sands. The Mudsdale getting itself healthy after taking that big first impression um, is able to close this one out. I am actually going to, you won't be able to see this, but Panda, the coach of the Samurots, did send me their paste before playing the set. Um, I don't remember what's in it. Um, it is choice band low kicks. So yeah, we saw that choice band first impression do a ton of damage, but it's not KOing a bulky Pokemon like Mudsdale. And then with the Samurott and the uh, Salazzle gone, Low Kicks just can't do anything after its first turn. And uh, I mean, Pancake Mix will definitely picked up on that, and we'll hunt those KOs with Cleavor again next game, or maybe bring a different game plan. But I think that Low Kicks might prove to be a liability at this point. Maybe they don't even bring it. We see Salazzle lead with Kilowattrel against Scraggy and Haunchcrow, the two Pokemon we didn't previously see from the Flat Sands. The Scraggy, of course, getting the Intimidate. And then Mudsdale comes in next to it. Don't know what else the Scraggy is going to do. Mudsdale now facing a special attacker and Hisui and Samurott. Scraggy has Coaching. There we go. Rock Slide misses the Kilowattrel, probably the target you'd rather hit. And the Aqua Cutter, Terra Water, Samurott. I thought that might KO the Mudsdale. It does not. And the Kilowattrel misses Air Slash. So big survive by Mudsdale there, potentially. As Rock Slide misses Kilowattrel again, but takes out Samurott. They should still be able to deal with the Mudsdale here. Yep, yeah, Air Slash finally connects. So Mudsdale has been traded for Samurott. And with Clefable coming in, I'm not necessarily sure that's a good trade. The Terra Psychic Clefable still takes a fair bit from Sludge Bomb, knocks Salazzle down to its Sash, 
Braggy finishes it off. And yeah, no low kicks this game. Clefable might just be able to... Well, okay, no. Clefable takes a Shadow Ball from Farigraph. And now Haunch Crow is left to clean up. Takes a lot from Kilowattril's Thunderbolt. It goes for a Power Herb Sky Attack into um, Farigraph. Does Kilowattril not win from here? Nope, it drops to a Sucker Punch crit. Plus one. Don't know if it's uh don't know if the crit mattered, but plus one sucker punch into Kilowattril. I think the crit might have mattered. It's probably um Oh no, it's not Super Luck Honchcrow, it's Moxie Honchcrow. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know who had the better odds in that endgame, but the Honchcrow closes it out. Um and I just I do I might as well also check the Ferrigraph set. Shadow Ball, Thunderbolt, Psychic Noise Protect, Rocky Helmet, Armor Tail. Kind of trying to be offensive, but it just didn't hit hard enough. And also got worn down. In any case, yeah, trading the Mudsdale for the Samurott pays off. Instead of just losing to Samurott, Mudsdale dodging the uh, air slashes is able to take it down and bring them to an end game where Honchkro just needs that one big attack to finish it. So some luck involved in that for sure, but still a solid performance. And the last set of the week now is um, Alaskan Absols versus Boston Biblically Accurate Mousehold. The Absols also bringing their new Pokemon in the Dusclops. Uh, they are bringing both Primarina and Bexcalibur. I kind of feel like they almost have to do that every week now just to get the KOs they need. They brought Girafferig with Dusclops, which is interesting. I kind of thought Girafferig might just ride the bench for the rest of the season. They might have some kind of trick room mode that they're going for here. And it could make sense, because the mouse hold is a fast threat on the other side. Hisui and Decidueye is not that fast, but it's not especially slow. We got double apples with the Diplin and the Flapple. So Flapple could be going for some kind of hustle game plan. Maybe you want to outslow that with Trick Room. This might actually be a very good week to have Dusclops here. Despite what I said about that trade, it might well prove its worth. And then. They again have the uh, nerfed Mouse Ape with Prime Ape instead of an Isle Ape. But anyway, get right into it. Dusclops and Umbreon leading against Meowstic and Mousehold. Oh, and Dusclops also can't get KO'd by Population Bomb. So that's something. It can get taunted, though. And they do deny the Trick Room with that. Um, as Meowstic sets Gravity. And switches out to Flapple on the Calm Mind Umbreon. Triple Arrows takes Umbreon out with a crit. It does have a boosted crit rate. The Dusclops can taunt, can uh, Trick Room again, but... Okay, Flapple takes an Intimidate. Okay. And just goes right for Terra, Grass, Grab Apple, and Gravity. It does a lot of damage and drops Dusclops' defense stat, but Dusclops will get his Trick Room now if it wants it. That does. Flapple's out. Meow stick in. Earthquake Incineroar. Dusclops, of course, has to protect to avoid taking damage from that, but... It also just doesn't do that. I mean, Isui and Decidueye resists Earthquake. Even if it hadn't protected, I don't think it would take much. Terra Fire Incineroar could take a triple arrows, but it's getting worn down here. Gravity goes back up, so if they get Flapple in outside of Trick Room, then Grab Apple is still... Very strong. Incineroar Flare Blitz will take out Decidueye, but the recoil takes out Incineroar. But Mouse Holds, Population Bomb just do, does nothing to Dusclops. That might actually be important to this matchup. Grab Apple takes out Primarina. I don't think Dusclops can clutch this, but... No, not with Shadow Sneak. <laughs> Mouse Hold is left using Beat Up into Dusclops, but it actually does decent damage after the fast drop. But the real thing is the Grab Apple from Flapple. Um, the Grab Apple strat is a lot of fun to see. And. Yeah, it broke through pretty effectively there. The Hisui and Decidueye also was causing trouble for the Absols. I'm not sure that they had the best game plan into that Pokemon, but. It is tough. Um, it stabs cover for their strongest Pokemon pretty well. Um, Primarina, Baxcalibur, and Incineroar are all weak to either Grass or Fighting. Uh, Umbreon, of course, is also weak to fighting. So that put in a lot of work, and the Flapple was able to clean up, but... 
I think there's potential in a trick room mode if they can get the trick room up more quickly. Of course, the taunt mouse hold is an issue, and I think we saw that it has a covert cloak. Thanks to the dusk Ops' frisk. Yeah, so you can't even fake it out with Incineroar. Um, I don't know how they'll adjust for that, but one way to find out, and that's to watch game two. You see Incineroar lead with Bax Calibur against Mousehold and Primeape, so not going right for a Trick Room this time. Primeape does, of course, get the Defiant boost. Terra Dragon, Bax Calibur. Looking to just rip off a Glaive Rush. Yep, takes out the Mousehold. So no more Taunt and no more Population Bomb. Bax Calibur just going right for another Glaive Rush. And taking out the Primeape. And Desujuai drops the Cineroar, but that means Baxcalibur is... We know now that Baxcalibur is the fastest Pokemon on the field. We see the Terra Poison on Desujuai. We see the Diplin in the last slot. The Baxcalibur can just get another KO now with uh, Glaive Rush, I'm pretty sure. The Absol's adjustment was to just go for it. And it's paid off in a big way. The Baxcalibur putting in a lot of work so far. And getting all four KOs. Look at that! Baxcalibur just one-shotting everything with Glaive Rush this game. That's one way to adjust, I guess. Um, what happened turn one? Oh, ba Baxcalibur was just faster than Mousehold. Maybe it's Scarfed. Faster than Mousehold. They, they knew it would be faster than Hisui and Decidueye, so you can't even just Population Bomb into it to adjust for that. Maybe there's something that, maybe the Meowth deck has some tech in game three to shut the Baxcalibur down? I don't know, but that was a lot of fun to watch, and we'll see if Baxcalibur can do it again. As it does lead next to Umbreon here, into Meowth stick and Hisui and Decidui. So we might see the Meowth stick do something here. Goes for Fake Out into Baxcalibur. Triple Arrows crits, doesn't KO. Umbreon just going right for Calm Mind in the face of Hisui and Decidui. <laughs> The Absols are just fearless in this set. They they won game two by just going for it, and I guess the lesson is keep going. But there's the Thunder Wave Meow Stick. It will drop to a Glaive Rush, but I think that's all the Baxcalibur can manage in this game. I would think the Decidueye was the more important target there, because the Meow Stick isn't really an offensive threat, but they trade Baxcalibur for Meow Stick. But now Umbreon is in a tough spot against Decidueye. They've already used their Terra on Baxcalibur. Which you really didn't need just to take out Meow Stick. So. And Umbreon might be able to put in work with its Terra available, but it's gonna be tough now. I think the I think the Terra might have been thrown a bit recklessly in this game. Flapple comes in. Uh, will of course not get gravity support this time. We see the razor claw on the Decidueye, so all the more reason it's getting all these crits. Gravapple still does decent damage to Dusclops and gets the drop. And Dusclops just gets taken out by a knockoff crit. And that Hisui and Decidueye is going to be a giant problem for both of these Dark types that the Absols have left. And then the Mousehold also is threatening Population Bomb. You no longer have the uh, Dusclops immunity. Umbreon's not taking too much from it, at least. But these hits add up. And drops triple arrows. And it's all up to Incineroar now. Darkest Lariat does some damage to Mousehold, but Population Bomb might KO. Uh, I don't think it will, but then Triple Arrow as well. So, every game of this set was either the Decidueye or the Baxcalibur popping off. Um, yeah, I think Baxcalibur needed to KO Decidueye instead of Meow Stick. And I think if you are going for Meow Stick, um, well, I guess the Terra Dragon was what enabled Baxcalibur to survive the Triple Arrows turn one, and since I think Baxcalibur is choice, it doesn't have Protect, but maybe it just needed to pivot. Of course, Dusclops isn't immune to scrappy Triple Arrows, but maybe, I don't know that Dusclops is doing that much for you in this game anyway, maybe Baxcalibur just needed to pivot and get a more favorable position there without the fake out pressure. But I, yeah, I think just going Terra Dragon, attacking, letting Baxcalibur take a lot of damage, turn one, was, a, was an issue this game, as it wasn't able to just sweep like it did in game two. And KOing the Meowstick meant the Decidueye was free to just 
spam crits into two fighting weaknesses and a knockoff weakness with the mouse hold supporting it. But um, that was a really fun game too, and it was a fun set all around, and it was a fun week of Prismatic Draft League gameplay. See you next time for week four. <laughs>